Hey Dave, I'm going to Copenhagen. Bye! Denmark, like Venezuela, has stripped people of their opportunities. Is that the direction that we want to go in? Well, so long as we know what democratic socialism is, and if we know that in countries in Scandinavia, like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, they are very democratic countries. Obviously, the voter turnout is a lot higher than it is in the United States. In those countries, health care is a right of all people. In those countries, college education, graduate school is free. Uh, in those countries, retirement benefits, child care are stronger than in the United States of America. And in those countries, by and large, government works for ordinary people in the middle class rather than, as is the case right now in our country, uh, for the billionaire. I but if you look at countries like, like Denmark, for example, there's still enormous private ownership of business. This is true in most of the, uh, most of the Nordic and, and Scandinavian countries anyway. We want improved and expanded Medicare for all. We want tuition-free public colleges and trade schools. We want a Green New Deal to address climate change. Like, it, 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 and I think we should look to countries like Denmark, like Sweden, and Norway, and learn from what they have accomplished for their working people. Like, it, it, the, my problem with socialism is that, is that it is essentially somebody subjectively deciding the value of your own labor. The Kingdom of Denmark is located southwest of Sweden and south of Norway. It emerged in the 10th century as a seafaring nation struggling for control of the Baltic Sea. Initially, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark were all controlled by a single sovereign ruler, but eventually with Swedish secession, my, that's a mouthful, and Norway separating in 1814, it became the kingdom we all know and love today. Thanks in large part by being ruled by a dog queen. Actually, the center-left Socialist Democratic Party led a string of coalition governments in the second half of the 20th century, which introduced the Nordic welfare model. Despite these decisions that would certainly enrage the Charlie Kirks of today, I live as a capitalist. Hey! Denmark is considered one of the most economically and socially developed countries in the world. It frequently ranks in the top five country rankings for national performance, education, healthcare, and protection of civil liberties. I'm here in front of Grundtig, and I'm probably butchering that word terribly, it's a church in Copenhagen, but I'm here in Copenhagen, home of Hans Christian Andersen and Björk Engels, to see whether social democracy is alive and well in here, or whether it's a democracy or socialist, or maybe some hybrid of the two. I uh, want to find out if this is the home of Bernie Sanders, whether or not Oscar Cortez and Bernie Sanders would lay down their lives to die here, and if the world of social democracy is alive and well in this beautiful and stunning country. Join me and my frozen nipples as we explore Copenhagen. My journey into the heart of social democracy first began with failed attempts at trying to define it myself. It's only thanks to the marvels of socialism that we have things like the restaurant porn sack. We're about to ride the metro and it's literally powered by socialism. Socialism is art. But the streets are definitely paved. Socialism. Extreme wealth, decadence, excess, not made possible through anything other than socialism. It wasn't long before I realized that I would need to actually speak to a Dane in order to truly understand how social democracy works in the country. So I met up with an old friend, Frederick Olofsson. My name is uh, Frederick Olofsson. I'm a co-owner of a Copenhagen-based record label, Riot Bull Records, which I operate with uh, Snouts and uh, the man behind it all, the also known as the legend, Søren Mensberg. I also work at a Copenhagen-based advertising agency as a motion graphics designer. And I have a sketchy background as a touring DJ under the Frederick. Everybody should have the freedom to um, excel as much as, as much as they can, but they have to take care of each other, and um, that is also, I think, in some ways, your born responsibility as a Dane. If you want to understand, like how it works in Denmark, is that. Even though Bernie Sanders for North America would be considered like utter, utter leftist by um, probably the majority, he would be considered a right wing for the right wing parties in the parliament here. Which goes down to that we all more or less basically agree that we have to pay the roughly at least half of our income salary in taxes. Then it's once again uh, on, on margins, and then you, you have like these levels. If you earn more, then your percentage uh, keeps keeps rising accordingly. So it's more like how much should it rise, 
not whether it it should rise. In in comparison to to um, to socialism, no, it's still also super liberal on uh, on some policies uh, for, for for companies and stuff you can can deduct and it. Most of the parties agree that um, a free market is a driver also for a socialist state or else you're gonna be somewhere at status quo and never move on. But I don't think that, that a Dane would consider himself a socialist. If you, if you ask a Dane, are you a socialist? He, he would, or he or she would probably think that you would be asking them, are you, are you flagging red, red banners and throwing in stuff inside the windows of the par parliament, even though you would consider us so socialist, like I think, social democracy, uh, do democrats and socialists are two very different things for us. So you would define yourself as a capitalist? No, I would. Pro uh, yeah, yeah, maybe in in a Danish perspective, but but not even a real ca capitalist because um, I would just acknowledge that capitalism is a thing. If you go the academic way, of course, then you have gymnasium, which is from 16 years to 20 or 19, that's three years. And then you start your, if once again, if you go the academic way, you will have um, three years uh, of a bachelor and then two years as a master's degree. Or three years if you are either spending longer time on it or you're starting to become a doctor. And um, all of this is free, of course unless you're attending a private school, which is both partially public and partially private. You still have to, to follow some of uh, the, the public standards, but you have to pay to go there if a school, for instance, has a particular focus on arts or crafts or, or, or something. Um, but when you turn 18, you um, get paid to go to school. Yeah. You get paid um, and I it's been a while since I, I got this kind of allowance, um, but I, at that time it was, uh, I think, 5,200 each month, Danish crowners. So you can compare that to whatever currency your viewers <laughs> have. Um, only to go to school a month. And the some people might think that this is utterly insane. Why, why would you? be paid to to go go to school so what i think and it's also been up to debate some 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 parties want to to change that but the entire idea is social mobility which is basically that you shouldn't have a um, rich backland that allows you to focus on school everybody should be able to excel as much as they can everybody agrees on on on, on healthcare more or less they have their different uh, views on some parties are thinking should some part of welfare be be paid and it's also weird because some parts of healthcare where welfare is already paid by by the user like you i i can get um, millions of danish crowners uh, paid by the state if i get cancer for my treatment but all dental work is not a part of uh, of uh, yeah What is that? Global warming? Yeah, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that answers um, yeah. my next six questions. No, no, no. <laughs> well, I don't know if you know that, that Denmark is uh, on the forefront still. And we have some of the biggest uh, uh, companies producing uh, um, windcraft, crafted power, and. Uh, Crystal, there's a lot of electric cars. Yeah, but not enough. But okay, taxes on cars, I think you pay like 200% taxes on a regular person car or something here. And they are so, and it's even compared to Sweden. And I knew, I know because I, I used to uh, do commercials for different uh, car, car companies that I could look at the pricing for the same car in Sweden and, and Denmark. And the Swedish uh, crown is way lower than the Danish, so it would be less than half in Swedish crowners than in Danish crowners in Sweden, and then the Swedish crown would be like 70% of the Danish crown, so it's really uh, expensive. Okay, the thing that I thought they should do, if they really want to do something about this shit, don't say that people have to be and they maybe can deduct some time. They also did some fucking stupid thing a, um, a couple of years ago, where they removed the deductible tax that people could get from uh, putting up solar 
um, power on their own roof. Probably because they realized that people weren't buying as much ele electricity from the state. And then what the fuck? Uh, do you want to go green or do you want to make... Yeah, yeah. All right. So Denmark isn't socialist in the way that we think of uh, socialism in the Karl Marx and uh, Engels sort of sense. The means of production are not owned by the workers. There are some very strong and powerful unions here. And there are some worker co-ops that should be uh, models for the rest of the world. There's definitely a great sense of camaraderie, uh, powerful orgasms had by many, not just by a few. Um, but at the same time, it's not exactly the socialist utopia that Bernie Sanders or Escazio Cortez might be thinking of. But there is a lot to admire here. Frederick gave me a deeper appreciation for the Danes, and it was time to explore. As a city, Copenhagen is remarkably flat, making biking the preferable way to travel. Bicycles outnumber cars 5 to 1 in the city, and the bike lanes are spacious. model was proving to be a powerful aphrodisiac. I go to Denmark. What is it, like 99% white? I don't need any security. The streets are incredibly clean. Crime is virtually non-existent. Nobody gets called a socialist. It wasn't all sunshine, rainbows, lollipops, and everything, however. An article released by The National around the same time as my trip painted a different picture. What's happening in this former bastion of liberalism is the normalization of white hostility to immigration. Denmark is building on Australian and Israeli tactics to form a new strategy to disappear the refugee from society. Rejected asylum seekers are in legal limbo. Some of them are stateless and deprived of what Hannah Arendt calls the right to have rights. They are denied as citizens by their home countries and the EU refuses to recognize them as refugees so they have no legal status anywhere. In response to this opposition, the Danish government has taken more aggressive steps still. Adopting the Australian strategy of intercepting and offshoring refugees on Nauru, it now intends to house failed asylum seekers on the remote island of Lindholm. Denmark then is refining its psychological torture by subjecting asylum seekers to isolation and exclusion. However, being a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, I knew it was necessary to hear the story from both sides. So I met with Lena Rakowski. She's a journalist and translator working in Denmark. As an Australian living in Denmark, she had some unique takes on the problems inherent in the Danish social democracy model. Part of the reason that I moved to Scandinavia six years ago was because I was really fascinated with the Nordic welfare model and um, the societies and the heavy investment in social infrastructure, and I wanted to see it up close um, and hopefully take lessons for that back to my home country, Australia, which at the time in 2013 was swinging massively back towards the right and starting to see all kinds of cuts in social infrastructure. What I think is fantastic about Denmark is it does invest heavily in the social infrastructure here. I, the, the fact that it offers universal healthcare, the fact that it offers free education and subsidizes its students to study, um, translates to a society that is incredibly safe, has incredibly high levels of social trust, routinely tops all kinds of OECD outcomes on, on health and high employment rates. It's a very high functioning society and people are also able to, because there's a strong emphasis on work-life balance here, people are also able to chase identities that are not just work. But I think that in general, like Denmark is a society with many, many layers of xenophobia attached to it, which is something that isn't often discussed in the Anglosphere when the international gaze is applied to Denmark, because I think uh, with all the focus on everything that these, the, the Scandinavian and, and welfare model does well, um, people don't look into um, the experience of all the people living in this society. I, I think rooted at the idea of Danishness is this idea that to be Danish is to belong to a Scandinavian ethnicity. And it is, th this country is really coming up with, is really meeting with challenges as it becomes, as its borders become more open in, in this era of globalization. And it's seeing migration from people from cultures that are wildly, are, are non-European. Everyday Danish people 
would not like to think of themselves as xenophobic. But I think what's missing here in the discourse in Denmark is this idea that um, whiteness is something that needs to be unpacked and that systemic racism exists and Denmark isn't an innocent bystander to that. It isn't even an innocent bystander to the colonialist history that a lot of um, European nations have because Denmark too was a part of the slave trade and too colonized Greenland that it still has a super problematic relationship with. Now the, the government policy is shifting from one around focusing on integration to one around hardline assimilation. There's debates in Denmark about whether like pork should be enforced in school because pork is a big part of the Danish diet and I, I suppose in some traditionalist sense the Danish identity um, and now it's they, they want to introduce that as some kind of forced assimilation measure because it it confronts I, I guess certain Danes and the government that there are parts of their population that don't eat pork it has never really had to confront ideas like white privilege and what different kinds of identities mean um, and then that's coupled with the fact that in general, there's there's a cultural concept here that's incredibly popular around the world. It's called hugi, and it's taken the world by storm. It's launched a thousand uh, of books in um, in the English-speaking world about like how to hugi, how to, and it basically translates to cozy. It's lifted from this Danish um, cultural philosophy about making the home and every setting you're in very comfortable and very very cozy, and lighting candles. And Hoogie, I mean, what I think a lot of those books miss is, is how much Hoogie is embedded in the mentality here. In, in Denmark, when you meet somebody on the, on the street, you say, that was Hooglit to meet you. It was cozy to meet you. And what comes with that idea of coziness is also that you don't rock the boat. Everybody is alike and everybody makes everything comfortable and everyone makes spaces comfortable. Welcome to Hoogie Lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty hoogie. Oh, that's real hoogie. Yeah, that's that's hoogly right there. That's pretty hoogie too. That's not so hoogie. Yeah, now that's hoogie. Hoogie. And that's born of a communitarian philosophy that in one sense I think is incredibly beautiful. This idea of, of not thinking about yourself as an individualist, as as how hyper-capitalist countries would dictate, um, where, where you're only thinking for yourself and your own individual gain. It is a beautiful thing to think about yourself as a cog in a wheel and part of an ecosystem. But what's problematic is that it is based on a presumption that everybody has the same starting point and everybody has the same advantages and disadvantages and effectively the same identity. And that doesn't account for the reality of the world we live in, where your gender and your race and your sexuality can play a part in how you were perceived and come attached with all kinds of disadvantages. When I first moved to Denmark, I was completely under the impression that I was moving to one of the most gender progressive countries in the world. Denmark did have a feminist, uh, uh, sorry, not feminist. I'm not sure if she's a feminist or not, but they, it, it had a woman prime minister. Um, and what I encountered was that there was a lot of pushback against feminists in places that I wouldn't expect. So obviously sexism runs rampant in sort of every country and where I'm from in Australia that's completely true and a right-wing commentator in one country will sound the same in another. But I think what was interesting was look, if, if you move in a certain sphere in Australia, one that's made up of like an educated middle class, people who are artistic and cultural, work within journalism, media, anything related to the arts, in those circles it is absolutely acceptable to be a feminist. If anything, it's almost tab taboo now to at least not pay lip service of it, you know. And it, you know, it's another discussion how actually feminist those spaces are. But the language exists to have a conversation about feminism and gender. That same language didn't really exist in Denmark. When I first moved here, people started, and I would mention that I was a feminist, people would immediately say, oh, you hate men. Or they would say, I'm not a feminist, I'm a humanist, because I believe in equality. So immediately I learned that to be feminist here is something that was seen as synonymous with being anti-men, something that was synonymous with being anti-equality even, something that was rocking the boat and not hoogie. Hoogie. I, I think, in a, in a sense, it stems a little bit from this idea in Denmark that feminism was something we fought for in the 70s and we've achieved it. And, and there's this idea here that people are living in a post-feminist society. So if you're trying to point out more invisible uh, um, elements of sexism, like the way there's 
that women are mansplained to or, the, or implicit biases that might stop women from getting hired or moving into roles or that make women feel hypersexualized or that make women targets for sexual harassment in a workplace. Um, you're immediately kind of dismissed and gaslighted as being crazy and trying to be dramatic because the work of feminism has been won because we have women in public life and we have women in work. We might, but actually Denmark performs really, really badly in women in top leadership roles, partly because it doesn't have quotas. And what's also really problematic is that there is a lot of internalized misogyny here. So I think women have been almost conditioned here to, to because men hold so much sway and so much power in institutions and public life, they've been conditioned to appeal to men and say like, oh, I don't need a quota. I want to believe that I'm the right one for the job. Not thinking about, and there isn't that discourse here to talk about well, why there's all kinds of reasons that would stop women progressing. I mean, I do not think for a second that the reason Denmark is lagging behind on women in senior management roles uh, has at all to do with a lack of women's competence or even lack of education because women are outnumbering men in education. And yeah, we're not seeing that reflected back in jobs. Um, women make up half of film graduates and they only make 13% of the feature films made in Denmark. That These are all explained by gender, but Denmark doesn't have that framework. I think that inevitably, as Denmark gets more multicultural, more diverse, as it gets more and more voices creeping up in, in all kinds of aspects of this society, I basically think that it's the responsibility of everybody in Denmark to elevate voices that we otherwise don't hear. The most important part of any narrator is to walk towards the camera. It's how you establish authority. And by doing so, I've established that I am authority on the subject that I'm talking about. Unfortunately, I'm not. So while the Nordic model offers some of the most comprehensive social safety nets of any government, it's still riddled with problems. Something we also didn't mention is that because the system operates within the frameworks of capitalism, it's still adhering to its pitfalls. But all that being said, there's still a lot to love about the Danish model and the Danes themselves. Have you ever heard about the law of Yante? Okay, so, though roughly translated, you shouldn't think you're anybody, you shouldn't think you're better than anybody, and you shouldn't uh, think that you amount to anything. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, but, but that is actually be beautiful, but, but it's still so deeply rooted in, in a lot of things that even though you go more venture into the um, liberal or capitalistic um, way, you still kind of have this belonging that you are not um, in that sense raised above other people. You're all human beings. And it's also provocative because of course it drives you to, to, to do something more if something someone tells you that you are not amounting to do anything. <laughs> the city's ancient architecture fused with progressive tax redistribution makes it a unique experience, even if it's still struggling with issues of xenophobia and entrenched sexism. I was feeling hoogie for my trip, and I can't wait to return. Hopefully next time, I'll convince Dave to come with me. Hey Dave, I'm going to Copenhagen. Bye! Hey, thanks so much for watching, guys. If you want more of our stuff, you can click down here, hit the like button. You can click down here, hit the subscribe button and uh, continue watching. Thanks. And you can leave hate comments, too. I mean, the Internet loves hate comments. Uh, please don't do that. <laughs> Start a flame war. Who knows? <laughs> the power is yours. <laughs> Welcome to the Internet. <laughs> oh, God, help us all. <laughs>